Well, it is good to be in the house of the Lord together today and um, never take for granted uh, this opportunity that we have to worship him together. Stephen Covey, in a book that he wrote, it's, it's probably been over 20 years ago now, he tells the story of one day that he was uh, got, got into a subway, uh, subway car in New York City. And as he boarded this subway train, uh, he noticed that there was a gentleman in there who had two or three little children who were running around, uh, kind of running around out of order. He, he had no control over those children at all, and they were just kind of loud and disruptive. And, you know, he, he sat there and watched them for a while, and he debated whether or not to say something. And I don't know if you've ever been in a situation like that, but he certainly was. He debated whether he should say something. He, he kind of put the kibosh on it. He didn't say anything anything until it just got out of hand totally. Uh, and finally, he developed enough courage to just finally approach this man and call him out. He's like, excuse me, sir, but um, have you noticed that your children are just rambunctious? They're out of control. Can't you do something? And it's almost like uh, the man just woke up from a dream and said, oh, oh yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, you know, we're, we're just left the hospital and um, they just lost their mother and they really don't know how to respond and neither do I. Talk about a paradigm shift. You probably just experienced a paradigm shift as I told this story. You're probably ready to go, yeah, you know, you need to get in their face. You need to call them down when they're not controlling their children like that. Until there's a big change and you go, oh, wow, I can see this now from another pair of glasses. I can see what, what's going on from a different perspective and it radically changes everything. Paul's letter to the Romans often demands paradigm shifts. It really does. When we grasp the heart of Paul's arguments, our expectations of how religion are supposed to work are often turned upside down. They're turned on their head. And I'm telling you, today's text is no different. It really will do that. Let me just bring us up to speed on where we are in the book of Romans. We've learned that all mankind, Jews and Gentiles alike, are guilty before God in desperate need of a righteousness, a right standing, a right uh, state of being that is not inherent to any of us. We're not, none of us are good enough to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, so to speak. We need this righteousness that is outside of us, the righteousness of God. We've learned that a person is justified, is declared right by God, by grace, through faith, in the finished work of Jesus Christ and Him alone. And then beginning in chapter 5, we began to see how there are immense blessings that we receive because of our salvation in Christ. This union we have with Christ... Uh, through that, we learned a couple of weeks ago that we, or last week, that we've been enslaved to righteousness. So this lifelong growth that we experience as Christians, uh, we call sanctification. And it's essentially God working within us to make us become who we already are. And all of this is so because we're no longer under the law but we're now under grace. So what about the law? What's up with the law? What do we do with the law? What is its role now? That's what Paul deals with in chapter 7. So if you have your Bibles, I would invite you to turn with me to Romans chapter 7 when you find that either in your Bibles or your tablets or your devices. Romans chapter 7, I ask you to please stand in honor of God's Word as I read today's text. Our text today is very simple, verses 1 through 6. Paul continues his argument. He, he says, Or do you not know, brothers... 
For I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she's released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that you might bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. So our sermon outline today is really very simple. There is a main principle that is uh, found in verse number 1. So that's the the general principle. And then in verse 2 and verse 3, the Apostle Paul illustrates it through uh, the the law of adultery or the law of marriage. And then in verses 4, 5, and 6, he makes application to this principle so that we have an understanding of how it is that we apply this to our lives today. Let's go to the Lord and let's pray. Father, unless you move, unless you um, open our eyes and our ears, we will not understand, we will not grasp this text. And Father, we need you. We are a desperate, needy people. And so God, um, Lord, we just simply ask today that we be yielded and still and that Lord, through your Holy Spirit, you will make this text come alive to us. And God, that it would, that you would apply it to our hearts and that we might respond in obedience. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen and amen. And you may be seated. So the principle, as found again in verse number one, or do you not know, brothers, For I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. So here's the principle. The law has dominion over a man or a woman as long as he or she is alive. So what is Paul talking about, first of all, when he talks about the law? The law has dominion over us as long as we are alive. Uh, What does he mean by the word law or that phrase law? Well, in a nutshell, he's talking about the Mosaic law. The commands that God gave Moses on Mount Sinai over the course of 40 days and 40 nights. And so so we can uh, focus a little bit on this. What is he um, talking about in specific when we talk about the Mosaic Law? uh, Theologians, Bible students, or or whatever have um, helped us tremendously in seeing the way that the law can be divided. So we're going to talk about the three divisions of the law, right? Three ways of looking at the law. Number one are the ceremonial laws. The ceremonial laws. These were the laws, again, in, in, uh, found in Deuteronomy and Exodus, that are prescribed. They prescribe the various religious elements, the, the instruments like the tabernacle, and then the ceremonies like the Day of Atonement that were given to Israel so that they could have communion with God. So they're uh, the, the instruments, like the tabernacle, they are the, the different ceremonies, like the Day of Atonement, 
given to the people of Israel that they could commune correctly with God. These ceremonial laws also included the, um, the, the whole sacrificial system, right? And the shedding of animals' blood for the remission of sin. We're talking about the ceremonial laws. But here's the point. All of these ceremonial laws were shadows that pointed to Christ. Then Christ comes and He fulfills all of the ceremonial laws. They've been abolished. They are obsolete. That's why we don't gather on Sundays and sacrifice bulls and goats and things like that. Those were ceremonial laws. Those were shadows of that which was to come. Christ comes, the ceremonial laws are abolished. Does that make sense to everybody? We're good on that. Ceremonial laws. But number two, the Mosaic law consists of civil laws or various judicial laws. These were laws that God gave specifically to ethnic Israel. What I mean by ethnic Israel, uh, those of the bloodline of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, and the 12 tribes. Right? So that's ethnic Israel. These are the laws God gave specifically to ethnic Israel to live and prosper in the promised land. This was when Israel was a theocracy. Are you familiar with that word? Theocracy, that is a government directly under God. Well, so for example, God had various sundry laws, civil laws, and we could spend a long time talking about these different laws, but one, just one, we'll just pull one out, is uh, you shall not uh, uh, harvest, I'm just going to put it in layman's terms, harvest the entire field when you go to harvest your grain. Right? You should round, you should just kind of like do an oval. Right? Don't go all the way down, leave an oval. Why, why did he prescribe that? That's right. That's right. He, he, he made this civil law because there, he says there will always be poor among you. Don't glean that entire field. You just sort of do an oval, leave all of these corners open so that the poor can come along and glean in the field. Most people, most commentators argue that these civil laws no longer pertain since Israel as a theocracy no longer exists. Does that make sense to y'all? So, so the, the ceremonial laws, they're gone. They've been fulfilled in Christ. The civil laws have been abrogated as well because they were designed for Israel to prosper in the promised land as a theocracy. They're no longer there as a theocracy. The civil laws go away. But most people still believe in what's referred to as the general equity of these civil laws as being beneficial today. So for instance, we, don't, we won't necessarily have laws that say farmers do not uh, glean all of, your, uh, all of your corn, just go in there and do an oval and the poor people will come along and grab what's on the corners. We don't have that. But we do have certain laws, welfare laws, that are providing for the poor and the needy. Does that make sense to y'all so far? So, so ceremonial laws, civil or judicial laws, but there are some exceptions. What I mean exceptions, some people, I'm just throwing this out there now because you hear a lot about it these days, there are some who still believe that these civil laws should apply to every culture that's around. I don't know if you've ever heard of the term theonomist or Christian reconstructionist. I don't know if you ever heard those terms. You've probably heard the term Christian nationalist or Christian nationalism. Um, that's a term that's thrown around. It's a loaded term. It means Christian nationalism means different things to different people. I'm just putting it out there just to, to show you that there are various people along that spectrum who their perspective on these civil laws and how they still apply. Okay, I, I feel like I made that muddied and didn't really make it clear. But uh, there's civil law and there's ceremonial law. But third, there's the moral law, God's moral law. This refers to God's rights and wrongs. God's rights and wrongs that transcend time and all cultures. 
these rights and these wrongs were written on Adam's heart. And they were most clearly defined when God gave Israel the Ten Commandments written on stone. So these rights and wrongs, I believe, I don't have to believe, the Bible would teach this, these right and wrongs are still written on mankind's heart. Now they might be foggy because of the immense evil that's all around us. But every person in his or her heart generally knows right from wrong. And unlike the ceremonial and the civil laws, God's moral law is never been abrogated. They are binding on all people for all time. So that's just a brief introduction to the law. And we've learned last week that believers are no longer bound to the law. So what's he talking about? What does that mean? We're under grace. Well, we've just read, we've already seen in verse 1, that the law has no dominion over us when we die, but it has dominion over men and women as long as they are alive. What is it that Paul is getting at here? Well, he helps us to understand by using an illustration in verses 2 and 3. Let's go back and read it again. He's making a point. He says, for a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law, and if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. So here Paul uses the law of adultery or the law of a marriage to make a point. He's basically saying uh, a woman is bound to her husband forever. That's what happens when you stand before God and you you agree that I'm going to be together. Uh, We will be together till what? Till death do us part. Y'all got that, right? Y'all ready for that next week? Okay, till death do you part. You got a week left. You got a week. You still got a week, man. Very thankful for you. Very thankful that... um, you know, when young people nowadays just, they want to just try things out and whatever, and you're committing to one another in the bond of marriage, praise God. And we're praying for you um, as you grow, and we'll be watching you, uh, learning from you and helping you in some ways if, if we can. So praise God for, for you. So, but the, Paul's making the point, though, that when you do, when you say, I do, and he's using the, the, the instance of a woman, when she says, I do, She's bound to her husband for how long? Forever? Until he dies. Yeah, forever, but until he dies in reality. And then he says, so if she marries someone else, if she moves away and lives with someone else while her husband is still alive, what is she? She's an adulteress. Right? That's the point he's making. But if her husband dies, she's free, right? She's free to to go get married again. Well, first of all, some of you are squirming right now. I can tell you're squirming. You think, I didn't know this was a sermon on adultery. I didn't know it's a sermon on divorce and remarriage. It's not. And if we just simply go to Romans chapter 7, the first six verses, and say that this is somehow a full orb biblical teaching on marriage and divorce, we're going to miss some things. So that's not what this is at all. It's truth. This is truth. But there's more than this, but not not less than this when it comes to marriage. But that's not what he's teaching here. The the real point he's making here, he's wanting to, to show us The illustration of a woman being married, and she is married by law, but when her husband dies, now she is free. She's free to remarry. Now Paul goes on, and he's going to the application. He's given us the principle, you're bound by law as long as you're alive. He's given us an illustration of marriage, but here's the application. I won't read those verses again. No, I'll tell you what I will. Likewise, my brothers, likewise, likewise, in the same manner. He's just showing that was an illustration. And here's the application. My brothers, you have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong 
to another. Do you see this point he's making now? Now, the illustration, it's a little bit um, quirky because it's, it, it doesn't line up exactly right here. Um, in this illustration, the husband dies, but now he's saying you've died. So we, we lose a little bit if we try to make a one-for-one -one correspondence, but that, we don't have to do that. We just take the main point he's making. And the main point is this. We're still talking about the blessings that we have in Christ. Our union with Christ, and here he is saying, through our union with Christ, we died on that cross. We were buried with Christ, and we have risen with him. Why? Because how good we are? No, but because we have been placed in Christ. I'm convinced the more I study this, chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8 are all about the wonderful, amazing, gracious, glorious benefits and blessings that are ours because of being in Christ. We died to the bondage of the law for our justification. We are now free to marry another. Who is it that we marry? The bridegroom himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Why? We're united to Christ in order to bring forth fruit unto God. And we talked about this last week. That's sanctification. Recall, this sanctification is the process by which the Spirit of God is working in us so that we might become, in actuality, who we already are positionally. Does that make sense to you? I mean, if, if, we, if we miss anything, let's, let's take this from chapter 5 and chapter 6. This is who we are positionally. We are in Christ. We are righteous. We are the apple of God's eye. We are holy. We are blameless. We are pure. We were, are without spot. Church, that's who you are in God's eyes. Do you understand that? Even though you don't always feel that way. And he's telling us, God is at work in us all along in our lives. From the day we get saved until the day we go home to be with Jesus, he is sanctifying us and he is making us, he is forming us, he's conforming us to the people that we already are positionally. That's sanctification. So our union with Christ assures us that when we, when we die, listen, it assures us, this is good news, when we die, and we stand before a holy God and His piercing eyes bore holes through us. And He asked us, why should I allow you into heaven? The only response, and praise God, the beautiful response is simply, I am found in Christ. I am found in Christ. That's signed, sealed, and delivered. Right? Jesus says, you know, I am in you. You are in me. We are in the Father. And no one is able to pluck us out of the Father's hands. So that's, that's future. That, that, that's, that's our ultimate landing spot. But as pilgrims on this earth, we are still to yield ourselves to righteousness, to become holy even as God is holy. So what about the law then? If we have been, we've been set free from this moral law, listen, we, we're no longer bound by trying to keep God's moral law to stand before God as pure and holy because, number one, we can't do it. Right? So, so we're free from that. But I've already just said, God's moral law, is, it transcends all cultures and it transcends all times. And we're always still bound to it in some way. What is going on here? What do we do with the law now? The reformers were very, very helpful in this area. So I'm just going to use their nomenclature and share with you uh, what, what they talk about as the three uses of the law. Three ways the law is used. Number one, the law is a mirror. That's a hard word for me to say. Mirror. 
mirror. Mirror. The law is a piece of glass that reflects who we are. You see, when we look into this mirror, when we look at that and we see ourselves for what we really are, I've probably, I'm, I'm sure I've shared this with you before, but when we lived in Hawaii, um, it's probably the best that I personally ever looked, and that's not saying a whole lot, but I remember we went to this, this banquet one night. We had our pictures taken, and these pictures were, uh, man, my wife was so beautiful then, and I mean, so dark, and I mean, it was just a beautiful picture, and in the, in the, the lens was one of those lenses, real fuzzy, right? So it just kind of, you know, just, I don't know how they do that back then. As before, what do they do with pictures now? What's, huh? And, yeah, Photoshop. Yeah, it was before Photoshop, right? And so you were what you got. And so the best they could do is just blur the, you know, the lens or whatever. So I remember getting those pictures back. And I remember going, wow, man, we looking pretty good. You know, been in Hawaii about, about a year and got dark tans and just, you know, looking good. And I, and I think that picture, I was wearing my navy white choker uniform like, man. And then the next morning, uh, I went into our, our bathroom in our little little house we live there in Hawaii, and it had it didn't have lights like those little yellow lights, right? You can't hardly see. It had bright fluorescent. You turn on the lights like, you know, there's no sleep left when you turn that light on. And it was the medicine cabinet had it. The overhead light was also fluorescent light. And I turned it on. I started looking in the mirror and going, hold on, hold on. That's not the same dude in that picture, right? You start seeing all these cracks in your teeth and zits and all. Y'all look around like you don't have that stuff, right? But, but, I mean, I was looking and going, no, that, is that really me? I mean, you, you, not, you come back to earth really quickly, right? You see yourself for who you really are. And that's what the reformers are talking about. They're talking about the law. When we look into God's law and we see God's holiness, what did Isaiah, when Isaiah saw Jesus Christ high and lifted up, what did he do? Did he go raising his hands and go, praise God? No, he's like, get, get away from me. I, I, what did Peter do when he realized this is Jesus Catching all these fish, did Peter go, hey, Jesus, high five. Hey, I need some more fish. What did he do? He said, he said, get away from me. He said, you're holy. And I'm a sinful man. And that's one way the law works. We get into the law and we start reading God's do's and don'ts and His rights and wrongs and you shall and you shall not. And very quickly we go, whoa, that's a mirror shining on me and it is not beautiful. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. So what does it do? Well, one, one thing it would do is, I mean, you, open, you turn on that light and you see what you really look like, it's going to drive you to the dermatologist. It will. You stick that thermometer in, you got a 104 degree temperature, what do you do? Ooh, I'm healed now, that's good. No, you stick that in, you got a 104 degree temperature, it's going to drive you to the doctor. And when you open up God's Word and you see God's law and you see how far short you fall, it's going to drive you to the only one who can heal you. It's going to drive you to the feet of Jesus. So that's one way the law is used now. But a second way we can speak of the law, its use of the law, is the law is a curb. It's a curb. It's a boundary. All mankind has God's moral law written on its heart. So all civilizations, all civilizations have laws that in some way reflect God's law. Right? So, so God's law is, is it's, not, it's not perfect the way it's understood by cultures. But listen, Based on God's law and the laws that man makes, they're put in place. Why? So that this whole world that we live in doesn't just simply implode. Can you imagine living in a place where there are no laws? And you look at all the laws and they arise from God's word. This is all part of God's common grace. It rains on the just and the unjust alike. So... The law is a mirror. The law is a curb. But third, the law is a rule of life. Is a rule of life. So, 
While it is absolutely true that you and I, as followers of Christ, as believers in Jesus, we are no longer bound to God's moral law, to keep God's moral law, to somehow please God and earn our own righteousness. We can't. There's no way we could ever do that. By the way, if you're here today without Jesus Christ, you are still bound to God's law. You are. That means when you stand before God, and that will happen one day, and He were to look at you and ask you, why should I let you into heaven? Your answer had better be, because I have never once done anything that you've not wanted me to do. And I have always 100% done everything, God, that you have called me to do. If your answer falls short in any way, you'll not spend eternity in heaven with God. Why? Because God's demand, God's plumb line is not a 94. God's plumb line is not a 97. Those are good grades. God's plumb line is 100. And who can do that? None. But Jesus. But the law is a rule of life in such that God's moral law is good and it now serves as a rule of life. It serves us as a guideline as to how we are to live our lives now that we are free in Christ. We desire to keep God's law not to gain an entrance into heaven, but to please God. To become more like Christ. He's given us the way that we're to do that. Now, chapter 7, verses 5 and 6, they're comparable to chapter 6, verses 21 and 22. Go back and look in verse 21 of chapter 6. Paul still, he's, he's making the same kind of argument. He says in verse 20, But when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Now, verse 21, But what fruit were you getting at? that time from the things of which you are now ashamed. For the end of those things is death. So verse 21, he's saying, you know, your life without Christ, before that, the fruit that you were producing was rotten fruit. There was nothing good about you. Verse 22, but now, but now, But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and is in eternal life. There's this but now. Now look in verse 5 of chapter 7. Verse 5 says this, For while we were living in the flesh, that corresponds to verse 21, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit unto death. So it's reminding us that when we were in the flesh, when we were in Adam, when we were still controlled under the law, we were enslaved to sin, our bodies brought forth rotten fruit. We'll talk more about that next week. So what does Paul then mean in verse 6? He says, there it is, it word, those words again, but now, but now. He's contrasting, but now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. The King James Version says it this way, but now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of of the letter. Verse 6, just like verse uh, chapter 6, verse 22, but now, but now, but now, we're freed. Listen, we're freed from the oppressive demands of the law that required us to obey in order to gain justification. Now we are free to obey without the pressures of performance. Here's the only way that I can kind of, a way that I can kind of relate this. So, I'm just one of those kind of guys, when I was in school, uh, no, nah, that's not true. Not even school, not even college. But, but when I started seminary and then uh, did some more post-seminary kind of work, I had to make an A. I had to make an A. That's what I, I lived to make an A. And so when I was in seminary, um, I was pressed to make good grades. So I learned how to make A's. 
right? You can learn how to make an A and never really learn the material. You really can. I was more focused on making A's than I was enjoying and learning the material. I had this pressure of knowing, man, I've got to make an A. I don't know why I held that pressure, but I put that pressure on myself. Man, I've got to make an A. And so making an A became my, my goal, my, my desire, my dream. And learning the material really wasn't what I was focused on. It was only after I graduated from seminary and started reading stuff that they forced me to read in seminary. Now I'm reading the stuff, not to make an A, but I get to learn it. The pressure has been removed. I'm no longer forced to, to learn this stuff and memorize it just because I'm going to take a test sometime. No, I'm learning this stuff so I can know it and I can grow and learn God and know God even better. Does that make sense to you? When I died to performance, I was then free to learn. Paul is saying that the law was once written in stone. It was rigid. It was demanding. It was cold. Listen, it forces us to obey God from the outside in. But deep inside, we know none of us can keep that law no matter how hard we try. The more the law appears, the more I fall behind. But, listen, now having died to the rigid demands of perfection for my righteousness and being found in Christ and His righteousness, God has replaced this law of stone with the law of flesh. He saved us by grace. Listen, so that now I'm obeying God and I want to obey God, not because it's His heavy hand from the outside in, but from the inside out. He's saved us by grace to eternal life. The law, listen, the law is not something I must do, y'all. The law is what we get to do. Do you understand? He's talking here of serving, and this is sanctification. Man, I could go on and on. i I got to skip some stuff, so I need to land this airplane, but this is important. What does he mean by serving in the newness of the Spirit and not the oldness of the law? In the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. What is he referring to? Does he mean now that we just, we just live our lives guided by the Holy Spirit? And in every situation, we simply just trust our hearts? Y'all, don't ever simply just trust your heart. Because the Bible tells us that our hearts are desperately wicked, deceitful above all measure. Yes, our hearts have been changed, but they've not been perfected. We're still growing. And so it's more than just trusting my heart. No, the New Testament, the apostolic teachings, listen, they refer, they affirm all of the Old Testament Ten Commandments. Everything that's written in stone in the Ten Commandments shows back up again in the New Testament. Jesus, His teaching on the Sermon on the Mount makes His, makes his very plain. He didn't abolish the law. Jesus says that he's come to fulfill the law. He's come to reveal the law in its fullest sense. Right? So he says, you've heard that you're not to murder. But Jesus expands it. He says, but I tell you, you know, whoever is uh, you know, angry with his brother without a cause is in danger of the judgment. And so the Ten Commandments, when we look at the Ten Commandments in the fullness of the Spirit, you know, they don't shrink, they expand. Most of the Ten Commandments are, are prohibitions, right? They're, they say stuff like, you shall not, you shall not, you shall not. But know this, in every one of those you shall not, says a whole corresponding bunch of stuff that says, but because you shall not do this, therefore you are now able to do this. You shall not murder. What does that mean? <clears throat> You're not to kill, but what else? I mean, we're now, uh, we're free to love life. You get it? Love life. Appreciate life. Work for life. Know that everyone is, every person on this earth is created in the image of God. Love that image. Love life. You shall not commit adultery. Now we're free to love 
a beautiful marriage. You shall not covet. We're free to enjoy all the gifts that God has given us. We're more blessed when we give away than when we keep. You shall not steal. Yeah, you shouldn't steal, but you're now free to work diligently and, and enjoy the job that, it, that God has given us. Well, that's probably enough for today. We'll, we'll bring this to a close. So, remember, so here's the principle. The principle is the law is binding on you how long? As long as we're alive. So... Is it still binding on you for justification purposes? In other words, to, to earn your way into heaven? Is it still binding on you? Why not? Christ did the work, but in particular, in, in according to this passage, what happened? Oh, oh, okay. But in specific, I, I just said the law is binding until something happens. What has to happen? Died. How did you die? In Christ. Walk away. Y'all, if you forget everything else, I'm telling you, if you forget everything that I flapped up here about for 40 minutes, remember this as you go home. Praise God. I am in Christ. In Christ. Christ. That means I don't always have to feel it. I'm not going to be perfect. I'm going to wrestle with sin until the day I die. But you know what? When I stand before a holy God and He looks at me, my eternal life is not based on how well I kept God's moral law. Jesus is the only person who ever kept God's moral law. And guess what? By grace, through faith, God places me and you who believe in Christ. So Christ fulfilled all of the law that none of us could feel. Christ died on a cross for sins that none of us could die for. That, my friends, is good news. That is good news. And when I know that I have died to the law... Man, I can live life now, not with the pressures of, okay, God's in heaven like a whack-a-mole, and he's watching everything I do, and if I get a little bit out of line, God's, and he hits me, boom, and he hits me, and he hits me, and he hits me, and that's what life is all about, is just trying to, try to navigate the straight and narrow. No, no, he's changed me, and I don't have to worry about that. I get to follow the straight and narrow. Well, Chapter 7 is one of my favorite chapters in all the Bible. Next week promises to be, I think, encouraging for the believer. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Lord and our God and our Father, we thank you for this word. Lord, we thank you for your law. We thank you that, Lord, as we gaze into the law, it shows us how far short we really are. And Father, it may be that here this morning there are some who have never trusted Christ who look into your law and see how far he or she falls and knows if he or she were to die this very day, they would go to hell because they've rejected Jesus, God the Son. And Lord, we pray, and I pray right now, Lord, that you might open the eyes of the blind this very moment and draw lost people to Christ. Lord, Save people for your glory and for your namesake, we ask. And then, Father, for others of us who, who are, are believers, God, but, um, Lord, our, our, our vision sometimes gets murky and we, we, we turn the law into what it's really not. Father, thank you that you've given us the law. Thank you now, though, that, that we're, we're not forced to keep it out of compulsion, Lord, but because of the change you've made in our hearts that we desire to keep it. Not always, and we don't do it perfectly. We know that, Lord, but thank you for the gospel of Jesus. Lord, we pray now as we close this time of worship that you would open our hearts to respond in a way that will glorify you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you don't know Jesus today, um, I don't know why you wouldn't want to know him. I don't know why you wouldn't follow him.
But chances are, I'm not big on chances. In fact, there's no such thing as chance. There are probably some people, more than one, in this room right now who don't know Christ. You, you know him in your mind, uh, but you don't know him in your heart. And God is saying this day, he says, I'm calling you. Will you respond? Today, as we stand and sing this song, if you don't know Christ, um, but you say, you know what, today is a day, I'm tired of playing games. Today, I'm surrendering. I'm coming to Christ. I'm repenting of my sins, and I'm receiving this grace that you've talked about. I give my life to Christ. If that describes you today, I'm going to ask you to do something really, it could be embarrassing to you, but it won't be embarrassing to God. I'm going to ask you to just, as we stand and sing, let's go ahead and stand. And if that describes you today, and you say, Preacher, uh, I, I want to know Jesus, and I need to know Jesus. As we start singing, I'm just going to ask you to come forward here this day, and I want to pray with you or pair you up with someone else who will pray with you and help explain to you exactly what it means to follow Jesus. Other believers, today perhaps you've been, uh, you've had a, your paradigm just has been shifted on what the law is all about, and you've just been burdened because thinking of God as a, as a whack-a-mole up there, and you, and you just say, God, please change my perspective that, that I might enjoy following you out of grace and not out of compulsion. Whatever that might be today, we're going to do just an old-fashioned invitation. We don't do this every Sunday, but today we're doing that. So, Lord, would you just begin playing, and after you played a verse or so, you can lead us in song. But don't wait. Don't wait. You need to lay a burden before the Lord today at this altar. Christians, you, you're free to come. You're free to respond. Unbelievers, you say, today I need Jesus, and I'm not ashamed to call him Lord. I need Jesus, and I'm not ashamed. Would you come? Would you come? Don't hold on to that pew. Surrender to, yield to the Holy Spirit this day.